the territory of modern-day Greece is considered to be the home of the first European civilization. These groups of islands, together with the surrounding peninsula, were the place where the first advanced cultures developed, the first wealthy cities emerged, and ultimately where the European civilization was born. First, the Cycladic culture appeared on the islands of the same name, approximately in the late 4th millennium BCE, and then soon after, even more advanced culture emerged on the island of Crete, growing into a great civilization that would dominate the Aegean for a very long period of time, until eventually being replaced by a new rising power originating from the Greek mainland. This new power were the Achaeans, one of the first Greeks to emerge during Bronze Age and form a great civilization of their own, known among the historians as the Mycenaean civilization. But how did these Achaeans get here and how did they grow into the power that they were? In this episode, we will talk about the development of their early settlements and the formation of their first royal dynasties. Wanax TV is a channel that walks you through the history of the Achaeans from the early Greek Bronze Age settlements through their expansion, conflicts with the Minoan Crete, the Hittite Empire, the legendary Trojan War and the great events of the Heroic Age, all the way through to the classical Greece, the Achaean League and the wars against the Roman Republic. Please consider subscribing and sharing the video as this is a one-person production and it greatly helps the visibility of the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. Different theories exist on the origins of the early Greeks, from various migrations of the distant past to presumed homeland in the northwestern Greek mountains, but one thing we do know, and that's that by the end of the 3rd millennium BCE, their first settlements started developing on the Peloponnese. The first Achaean town started emerging around the areas of Argos or Argolis and other surrounding regions. The term Argos originally did not refer to the city of Argos but to the territory of the Argive plains including Mycenae, Tiryns, Mydea, Lerna, the port of Napoleon, the town of Argos and a few other settlements. In the broader sense, Argos referred to the realm controlled by the Achaeans, a territory that would incorporate many other regions of the Greek mainland as well. That's why, in many of the ancient legends and traditions, Agamemnon, for example, the king of Mycenae, was referred to as the king of Argos, as did many other legendary kings whose royal seat was located in the palace of Mycenae. For this reason, the Achaeans were also known as the Argives. In Homer's Iliad, both of these terms, in addition to the term Danaeans, are applied as the general name of all Greeks who took part in the Trojan War. Besides Achaeans, there were also a number of other peoples inhabiting Greece in those early times. Although they did not leave any records of their own, and it is unknown to which degree were they related to the Achaeans and other Greek tribes, many of the ancient Greek writings mention peoples such as Pelasgians, Minians, and many other aboriginal inhabitants scattered across the Aegean. Pelasgians were attested in numerous sources and seemed to have been rather a group of tribes with various relations to each other and to the Greek populations. 
tribes that were considered originally Pelasgian were said to be scattered across both sides of the Aegean Sea from Peloponnese and Attica to northern Greece, the Aegean Islands, Crete and the coast of Asia Minor. In some cases, according to the ancient writers, Pelasgian tribes are mentioned as somewhat related to some of the Greek tribes, sometimes even presented as the ancestors of certain Greek populations, while in other cases they were clearly presented as non-Greek speakers. Minians were either a pre-Greek or a proto-Greek tribe that was most notably associated with the city of Boeotian Archomenos and played a big role in numerous myths and legends of the heroic age. They gave the name to the famous Minian ware, a style of pottery from early to mid 2nd millennium BCE that was discovered in the same area. Ultimately, all of these early original tribes would come to be absorbed first into the Achaean and then into Hellenic identity. But now back to the early 2nd millennium BCE, the Achaeans were just establishing their first cities and as many other tribes of the Aegean, they were under heavy cultural influence coming from the Minoan Crete. The Minoans were at the height of their power, dominating trade and enjoying great wealth. This trade network also positively reflected on their neighbors as well, including the Achaeans, who themselves managed to prosper on Peloponnese and slowly became a local power. Local rulers managed to gain wealth unlike ever before and became kings, founding their first royal dynasties on the Greek mainland. The region of Argos especially prospered during this time and thus the first Argive dynasty emerged sometime during 17th century BCE. Ancient Greeks attribute these events to Inachus, the first Argive king as well as a foundation myth of the city of Mycenae. In this story, Inachus had a daughter named Mycenae who eventually gave her name to the city. She was also mentioned by Homer who in Odyssey describes her as Mycenae of the fair crown and a fair tressed Achaean woman. As is the case with most of the ancient Greek traditions and foundation legends, it is impossible to verify most of these accounts. In reality, Mycenae had been inhabited since Neolithic age from around 5th millennium BCE, but nevertheless, the ancient myths are filled with foundation and refoundation legends of the heroic age, a period highly romanticized after the Mycenaean civilization had collapsed. Therefore, Inachus, being the first Wanax of the Argives, founded the Inachid dynasty. It is this time period to which the first Mycenaean royal cemetery can be dated to. It was constructed in the 7th century BCE and it was based on shaft graves, the deep burial structures specific to the Argives where their royal families were buried. Accompanying the decreased kings and princes were the famous golden masks, funerary armor, weapons and jewelry, while for women there were gold crowns and shiny clothes filled with gold ornaments. These things signified the wealth that the Achaeans were able to achieve towards the end of the Middle Bronze and the beginning of Late Bronze Age. Besides Argos, the early Achaean centers started emerging in other areas such as Pylos, Boeotia, Attica, Thea and Bronze Age Aeolia, later known as Thessaly. Another early town was Sicyon in northern Peloponnese inhabited by the Aegealians, an early tribe said to be related to the Pelasgians but also to the later Ionians. Their local dynasty was according to the ancient historians even older than the Inachids of Argos 
but had nowhere near the wealth, the influence or power that the Argives were able to gain. While there was likely some sense of kingship between these towns and cities, there was no unified state at this early period and Mycenae was still far removed from being a great power of the Aegean. They did, however, seem to exercise certain influence over the regions of Laconia and Messenia, the traditional core areas of the Achaeans. Another related region was that of Arcadia, a mountainous area in central Peloponnese, whose inhabitants were considered autochthonous to their mountains, but were also part of Achaean identity. King Inachus was succeeded by his son Foraneus, who is credited as being a good ruler and reducing the worship of Hera to the Argolis. He enjoyed a relatively peaceful reign and was so well respected that all the subsequent rulers were referred to as the House of Foraneus. However, his son and successor, Apis, was a figure to be remembered across Peloponnese in entirely different light. Now, the list of kings of Sicyon also mentions a ruler named Apis, as well as other names recognized as kings of Argos, so it might signify that since these early periods, Sicyon and its surrounding regions were already under the influence or even control of the kings of Mycenae. This would definitely be confirmed to be true by the time of the Trojan War, where northern Peloponnese was under the direct rule of Agamemnon, and even later times where Sicyon and the neighboring areas were controlled by the Argives. Either way, Apis greatly expanded his domains across Peloponnese, and even named the whole peninsula after himself. He was considered to be a cruel and tyrannical ruler, thirsty for power with an ambition to subjugate all of the neighboring regions under his rule. This attempt, however, would not succeed as Apis was eventually assassinated by Telchis and Thelxion, these two nobles, who likely belonged to the local ruling house of Sicyon, managed to end the terrorizing reign of Apis and restore the relative independence of their domains. The ancient sources are in conflict on whether Apis had a son or not, so his successor, named Argos, is designated as either nephew or a son of Apis. This ruler was said to be the eponymous king of the Argives. That is, however, impossible to verify since the ancient Greeks had tendency to explain names of cities, regions, rivers, tribes and pretty much everything else with a supposed eponymous ruler or a hero. So, a personal name Argos might very well be given after the region or a city of Argos which is certain to have already existed at the time. Either way, King Argos, succeeding Apis, followed some of his predecessor's policies and supposedly renamed the region after himself. But unlike Apis, Argos was highly respected and celebrated especially by the later Argives and had a sacred grove in Laconia dedicated to him. Following his death, he was succeeded by his son Creosos. It was likely during the reign of Creosos that the Argives avenged the death of King Apis who was previously murdered by the Sicyonians. Creosos's nephew, also named Argos, was the one who marched to Sicyon and slain Thalxion and Talchis, who were apparently both still alive at this time. Sicyon continued to be ruled by a local dynasty though, but it was more than likely that by this time they were under considerable influence of the Argive high kings. Increasing influence and wealth of Mycenae was further confirmed by the 16th century BCE construction of a Grave Circle A, a new royal cemetery even more grandiose than the original one. 
It was located to the right after the city entrance, and it had a diameter of almost 30 meters. It contained six large shaft graves, where royalty was buried with even more gold, weapons, and jewelry than before. It was about this time that the famous so-called Mask of Agamemnon is dated to. It was named so by the archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann, who unearthed it in the 19th century, mistakenly believing that it had belonged to King Agamemnon. King Chrysos was succeeded by his son, Phorbas, who was in turn succeeded by his son, Triopas. During 16th century BCE, the Achaeans, still heavily profiting from the long-distance network, continued to gradually spread their influence throughout the Greek mainland. The Aegean hegemony, however, was still held by the island of Crete, which still controlled the trade network and still exercised significant influence on the Achaeans, ranging from art to infrastructure to other aspects of life and society. After the death of Triopas, the sources are once again conflicting and are not clear about his immediate successor. The three descendants of Phoreneus that came after were named Yasos, Pelasgus, and Agenor. These three are somewhere depicted as the sons of Phoreneus, which wouldn't have been possible and likely meant members of the house of Phoreneus, while other sources have them as sons of Triopas himself. Either way, the Achaean territories were to be divided by the two elder brothers, Iasos and Pelasgus. Iasos received the territory around Elis in western Peloponnese, while Pelasgus built a city of Larissa on the Erasmus River. Now, Larissa was a common name for a city or a citadel and is associated with Pelasgians, so therefore no surprise that one of the brothers in question was said to bear name Pelasgus. Anyway, the youngest brother, Agenor, was initially left out of the division. This situation would not last for long, as Agenor slowly gathered his followers and soon after became the most powerful Achaean prince. So after the death of Iasos, which apparently came prematurely, Agenor was quick to invade and take control of his brother's realms, establishing himself as the undisputed king of the Argives. Apparently, this move was not very well received by the religious officials who soon came into conflict with the new Wanax. As the result of this conflict, those who did not side with Agenor were forced to leave the country. The most prominent was Troculus, a very influential priest of Demeter who had to leave Argos and settled in Attica. Agenor's reign was stable and effective, with basically all of the Peloponnese being stable under Argive rule, either directly or through certain alliances and influences over other local rulers. Agenor was succeeded by his son named Phoreneus, but better known as Crotopos. Crotopos was a very troubled ruler, mostly known for the problems he had caused to his own family. He ended up killing his own daughter, and the plague sent by god Apollo struck the Argives. While we will talk about this story in one of the next episodes, ultimately Crotopos abdicated and fled Argolis, leaving his son Stenelus to succeed him. Not much is known about the reign of Stenelus except that he corresponded the early 15th century BCE. It may have not been his reign that left significant impact on his time, but it certainly was another catastrophic event that would bring destruction and forever change the order of the Aegean. 
the volcanic eruption of Thera was perhaps the most devastating natural catastrophe of the Bronze Age Aegean. It heavily damaged the Minoan civilization on Crete, destroying its naval infrastructure, damaging its trade, and leaving the Minoans exposed and vulnerable. And while they would quickly rebuild and try to regain their hegemony, this event ultimately paved the way for their fall and rise of the Achaeans as the new power of the age. In the next episode, we will talk about the rise of the Achaeans into a great power, their domination of the Aegean Sea, and their conquest of the Minoan Crete. Thank you so much for watching. Please consider subscribing and sharing this video, as it greatly helps the visibility of the channel. This was 1XTV, and we'll see you again soon.